Praise God, praise God. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all our life groups. Here we are again, and I'm, and I'm so excited in bringing you another video uh, lesson for our study on the book of Genesis. How are you all doing? I hope you're doing well. You're doing great as we um, uh, continue uh, to study and to learn some of the principles behind the book of Genesis. And uh, last time we studied about uh, Abel and Cain, the first uh, the first brothers and the first murder that happened in the Bible. And now we're going to be discussing about the Tower of Babel or Babylon or Confucian in the other words. So this is, uh, I entitled this as Man versus God. And Man versus God, Genesis 11. All right, so uh, Genesis 11, basically, if you read that, it is uh, uh, divided into three categories. The first one is the Tower of Babel. And the second one is the uh, uh, Shem's descendants. And then the third one, uh, the third category. So the first category is in Genesis 11, 1 to 19, the Tower of Babel, which we will discuss right now. And then the second one, the second category is about Shem's descendants. Uh, from chapter 11, 10, verses 10 to 26. And the last category is about Terah's descendants, which is in verses 27 to 32. All right, so let's dive in. What can we learn from uh, the study of Genesis 11 regarding the Tower of Babel? Now, take note, prior to the building of the Tower of Babel or Confucian, during the generation of Noah, when the whole earth was destroyed by flood. We all know that, right? And the generation that came from Noah and his son Shem was actually the ones who initiated the building of the city and its tower called Tower of Babel. Now, uh, it's it's basically stated in, in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, the very purpose of why they build the tower it says there, when they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its stop in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And if you will notice, the very, the very thing that they fear about, okay, take note, the very reason their purpose of building a tower, the Tower of Babel, is so that uh, they can build a city, okay, that they can build a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and that they will make a name for themselves. Take note. What does it tell us? To make a name for themselves. It's basically telling us about pride, ego, right? And can you imagine um, the knowledge of humanity even thousands of years before or thousands of years ago, that they were able to build a tower using bricks. What kind of equipment do they have during that time? We never know. There was no uh, 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 specific stated in the Bible. But we all know that they did. They built a tower and their intention was to build a name, to make a name for themselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So the very thing that they fear about, the very thing that humanity fear about, that they will be dispersed or scattered, is the very same thing that happened to them. Now, the very one of the persons uh, very specific uh, who is uh, kind of significant in the building of the Tower of Babel and the city was actually Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, the only references for Nimrod is found in Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 to 12. So that is prior to chapter 11. And this is what it's written. In verse 8, Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad and Kalne in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and in verse 12, Resen between Nineveh and Kala. That is the great city. And another scripture that refers to Nimrod is in Micah chapter 5, verse 6. 
They will rule Assyria with drawn swords and enter the gates of the land of Nimrod. He will rescue us from the Assyrians when they pour over the borders to invade our land. Now, the land of Shinar was mentioned here. Basically, it refers to Babylon, which is today modern Iraq. The city of Babylon was located about 50 miles south of Baghdad along Euphrates River in present-day Iraq. Part of the history of Babylon is where the Hanging Garden was located, which was built by Nebuchadnezzar. So now, the question basically here is why did God confuse their language? Wherein he himself attests to it that he said in one of the verses in the scripture that the people of the earth are now one and nothing that they propose to do will not will to do will not be impossible so think about the statement of god here now that humanity is one they are one they are united and look at the power of unity god himself said now because they are now one nothing that they propose to do will not be impossible so meaning everything is possible when people becomes united okay and why did God disperse them all over the face of the earth? Even at the early period of humanity, man already had the desire for dominion and exaltation apart from God. So at the very core of man's heart is to seek something greater than themselves. And they're trying to do it even without God. It's the human nature to somehow rebel against God. And that's exactly what happened. Nimrod, who is a mighty hunter before the Lord, basically lead the people to rebel against God. And that is human nature from the very beginning when Adam and Eve uh, disobey God. It's the heart of rebellion in reality, trying to create something out, outside of God. And can you imagine, brothers and sisters, this is exactly what's happening right now, that people nowadays are trying to exclude God. They're trying to put God outside and they're trying to, to remove God in the equation. And it's not going to happen. All right? And that's why when God saw the very intent of their hearts, God came down and confused their language that caused them to stop building the tower and the city. And they were all dispersed over the face of the earth. And think of that. In reality, man can never achieve anything unless the Lord allows them to. So this is one of the lessons we can learn from this Tower of Babel. That man can never achieve anything unless God permits that. So take note, brothers and sisters, it is the very intent of humanity to basically uh, build something. They even intend to build a tower that will basically reach the heavens and that they are that they are their intention is to make their names and yet when god saw the intents of their heart god said to himself let us go down all right and god basically brought confusion for the first time and you know what all the people were scattered and they stopped building the city they stopped building the tower why because god already said it now that they are one nothing that they propose will be impossible so brothers and sisters God is telling us something here that the power of unity is, is, man, tremendous. That Can you imagine if the church today is united? If we as the body of Christ is united and we're not scattered, we're not doing our own thing. Can you imagine what the church of God can accomplish, brothers and sisters? But guess what? The prayer of Jesus in John 17 up until now, it's still unanswered. Remember what Jesus prayed in John 17? Oh, Father, as we are one, let them be as one as well so that they are one and we as one. And yet the prayer, the very prayer of Jesus for the, his believers, for his body to be united up until now, it's still unanswered. Why? Because the church of the Lord is still divided today, right? Different opinion, different beliefs. You know, uh, in reality, the churches cannot stand on its own. We are divided. And there is a saying, united we stand, divided we fall. 
And that's why during the first time, imagine in, Luke, in Genesis 11, God brought confusion in humanity because of their intentions of their hearts to build a city and a tower that reaches heaven without God. And yet God will never allow that. So God brought confusion. And at the very last time, I will, I will tell you one, another principle to learn here that the very reason why God scattered the people is for one purpose. All right? So we will find it out. Anyway, uh, we're going to have a break first and then we'll go to the second and third category of the uh, Genesis chapter 11. All right? So uh, all PICs and, and, and the facilitators, uh, you can either pause the video and have a break um, probably water break or bathroom break or whatnot. And then I'll proceed with the, uh, the second part of Genesis 11, the second and third category. All right, let me pause for now. All right, we're back. Praise God. So 10 minutes is fast. Time flies so fast. So I have another 10 minutes to go. And hopefully this time I, I will not do overtime, but uh, kind of indulge me on this if I do overtime again. Now, on the first category, we learned that man can never achieve anything unless the Lord allows them to. Okay, that's the sovereignty of God. All right, so we have tackled first the first category, the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, 1 to 9. At this time, we will proceed with the second category. What about Shem's descendants? What does it tell us in Genesis 11, 10 to 26? Here we can see that God enumerated all the descendants of Shem from the very, uh, very lineage of Noah. Okay, Noah, Shem is one of, of course, one of the sons of, of Noah. It says here, these are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Arpachshad two years after the flood. So two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he fathered Arpachshad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. Can you imagine 500 years old still having sons and daughters? And when Arpachshad uh, had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah. And Arpachshad lived after the fathered, after he fathered Shelah 403 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. Eber or Eber, and Sheila lived after he fathered Eber 403 years, okay, and had other sons and daughters. And when Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg, and Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Ryu, and Peleg lived after he fathered Ryu 209 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Ryu had lived 32 years, he fathered Serug. And Ryu lived after he fathered Serug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Serug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor. And Serug lived after he fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. And Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Terah lived had lived 70 years, he fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Now, in the second category, we will notice that one thing you will notice on the following verses here is that after the flood, the length of years of humanity, okay, humanity's existence were now shortened. Before the flood, people lived up to 900 plus years. Okay, and yet after the flood, it went down to 200 and under and even less. Now, we all know that Methuselah is the oldest person who ever lived 969 years. Adam only lived 930 years. Think about that. So here you will notice that uh, uh, from, the, from one of the sons of Noah came the lineage of Abraham. Shem was the great, great, great grandfather of Abraham where the people of Israel came from. So from this story, we can see that God is now identifying each of the lineage of humanity from where he has chosen a nation that came from where the promised seed was, who is our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so when you read your Bible and see these names written, okay, don't think that it's just to fill in more spaces in the Bible. 
It was written for the purpose of seeing where the generation of Jesus will be coming from. So here, God is basically unveiling the lineage of where Jesus will be coming from. From Noah okay, to Shem and Shem to Terah. And then so we can see the, the, the descendants of Shem here from chapter 11 verses 10 to 26. It was mentioned specifically every son okay, that came from Shem up to Terah. All right. So that is basically the generation of Shem. All right. And the lineage until it came to the point where Terah had lived 70 years and then he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. All right. So now on the third category is where we can see Terah's descendants. And again, I told you already that all these descendants are important in the Bible. There is a purpose why God uh, put it there. It's not by accident. It's not to fill in pages, but it is basically to for us to understand that God is concerned in every lineage, in every generation that follows, okay? And despite of the fact that God scattered the people, there is a purpose for that. And that is, I hope, another principle that we're going to be learning, okay? So here, the importance of the genealogy, the importance of generation upon generation is so important in God. God is so detailed, okay? He named every generation. He named every person that basically uh, Jesus came from the very lineage, from Noah, okay? From Noah to Shem, to Shem, and then Shem to Terah, and then Terah to Abraham. And then we know that Abraham is the patriarch. Abraham is the father of who? Okay, Abraham is the father of Isaac and Isaac is the father of Jacob and Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And from the 12 tribes of Israel, one of the sons of Abraham, Judah, is where the lineage where Jesus, the king of kings, came from. Hallelujah. Amen. So now in chapter 20, uh, chapter 11, verses 27 to 32, this is what it says. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. And we all know that Lot is also significant in the, in the story of Abraham. We all know that, right? Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And then in verse 29, And Abraham and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Even the specific of not having a child was written in the history of God's book. And then it says here in verse 31, Then then Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran his grandson and Sarai his daughter-in-law his son Abram's wife and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan and we know what Canaan is Canaan is the promised land that God gave Abraham remember that but when they came to Haran they settled there now there is a purpose there there is a purpose why uh, uh, Abraham did not really go through right away to Canaan. Why? Because God has a timing. Remember that. Everything that happened in our lives, God has a timeline. God has a timetable. It's not by accident. All right? So the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. And that's where it ended. Now, the last category is where it specifically outlined the generation of Abraham. His father, Terah, was one of the great, great, great grandchild of Noah from his son, Shem. This is where the Lord started writing the history of his chosen nation, Israel, which started from Abraham, where God established this covenant to be the God of his people. So, brothers and sisters, as we close down this chapter 11, and again, 20 minutes is very short for us to kind of, and, and we're just we're just basically uh, seeing the tip of the iceberg. We're ju I'm just giving you an overview of this chapter 11, but I know there's so much to learn, principles to, to learn and to dig in from this chapter. But think about this, the scattering of humanity, that's one of the questions that we need to answer. Why did God scatter the people? 
And why did God particularly brought confusion? He confused the language of humanity so that because of that confusion, because of that different language that was kind of built up because of confusion, then that is when the people scattered. Both the whole humanity was scattered over the face of the earth. And now, what is the principle behind that? Okay. This is where the Lord started writing the history of his chosen people, Israel. Now, the scattering of humanity on the face of the earth, which was caused by confusion, was never an accident. All right? It was part of the grand plan of God to bring about his intention of separating his, his what? His chosen people, Israel, from the rest of humanity. He intentionally handpicked a generation of people named Israel to be called his own people chosen for his name's sake. So brothers and sisters, as I close, we are so glad and we are to be glad because we who are Gentiles, remember we are Gentiles. There's only one chosen nation and that is Israel. But we who are Gentiles became a recipient of God's amazing grace and His everlasting mercy to be grafted in. Church, we were grafted in and, and become the spiritual Israelites to G, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise God. Abraham is our father. We are the spiritual Israelites. We as the church of the living God was grafted in. And by the way, let me reiterate this. If you, hear, uh, if you hear something about a theology that says the church replaced Israel, we call that replacement theology. That is not true. There is no such thing as replacement theology because no one can replace Israel. Israel will always be the chosen nation of God. Amen? And we, the church, were grafted in. Hallelujah. And Paul discussed this in the book of Romans. He said, if the olive tree, the wild olive tree was, was, uh, uh, was cut off and you, okay, you as a, a the, I mean, the genuine olive tree was cut, what cut, was cut off and you who are the wild grafted in, into the vine, then if God can, can cut off the true vine or the true olive, the olive tree, how much more you, the wild olive tree, cannot be cut down if the time comes. So brothers and sisters, aren't you glad we were grafted in and we became the spiritual Israelites and we are the, we are the church of the living God, the bride of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we are waiting for that blessed hope. So I hope we learned something today. And so uh, thank God for this opportunity. And again, chapter 11, and I'll be seeing you on the next video. And I hope that the, all the PICs and our facilitators will now be able to discuss some questions and, and discuss with one another what we learned today. Remember the first in the first category about Tower of Babel, we learned that man can never achieve anything unless the Lord allows them to, okay? And then another thing that we learn is the, the scattering of the people is for the purpose of God fulfilling His intention of selecting a certain generation, a certain nation that God will call them His own people, and that is the people of Israel. And then thirdly, we all know that we as the church were grafted in because of God's grace and mercy. Amen? Praise God. So again, thank you so much for joining me in this short video about uh, the study of the Tower of Babel, man versus God in Genesis chapter 11. So God bless you. Enjoy your discussion right now. And we'll see you again on the next video. God bless. Bye.